Okay, good morning. So I have a massive disclaimer before we get going, and that is, I am not a man. I've never been a man, I don't know what it's like to be a man, but I am a partner, a daughter, a co-worker, and a friend to many men, and I'm the mother of three children who are all male. So men's mental health matters greatly to me. Um, I'm also the survivor of my brother's suicide. I might need your help here because I'm all backwards. Okay. Um, Carson was a 34-year-old businessman in Denver, Colorado, and by all external accounts was uh, living a life that people would find very admirable and achievable and desirable, but behind that facade he had a lot of demons that he was plagued with. Um, he had been diagnosed with bipolar illness at age 19 and that proved to be fatal. And so in the aftermath of his death, our family and his closest friends decided in our grief reaction um, in 2004 to do something. And the mission of the organization of the Carson J. Spencer Foundation was formed to do bold gap-filling work to prevent what happened to Carson from happening to other people. Um, so um, I'm just gonna highlight one of our programs today since I just have a very brief period of time, but I'm already so encouraged by the conversations that are happening here. Um, Dr. Evans, thank you for acknowledging that women do have a role in this conversation and that we do matter. Um, that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, and that this is preventable, that a lot of the causes of death are preventable. There's a big initiative um, internationally right now called Zero Suicide, that our goal is zero and that we should really figure out how to get there. Um, I also want to thank uh, Anna and Jimmy and Brandon for inviting me in. This was kind of a last minute arrangement um, and so I'm feeling very honored to be um, put into this agenda because um, mental health is not always thought of as part of an overall health issue. Sometimes it's somewhere off to the side and it absolutely is integrated in the conversation. Um, Dr. Bonham, I'm sorry to catch uh, just the tail end of your comments. Um, but I really appreciated your conversation about really meeting men where they're at, especially the ones that are falling th th through the cracks that we need to um, reach out and also engage their peers uh, in very important ways and their partners. Um, and then um, Mr. Savs, uh, also the, the connections with uh, fatherhood are really critical, I think, across the spectrum. And even in the mental health conversation, I don't think we talk enough about the social determinants of mental health. Um, and that it tends to be a little bit more clinical, I think, than is useful in a lot of the conversations around men. And so our work, too, is really focused on upstream approaches and advocacy and strengthening families and these kinds of conversations. And I'm smiling to pieces to know that you guys are here because uh, the fatherhood um, videos that you talked about were really a strong part of the inspiration that got us to where we are, um, that you'll see um, going forward. So I'm gonna pass around these coasters and, co and business cards. There's one for each of you, and then there's, this is just a little show and tell, so there's several different types here, and I'll explain it as we go. All right. Uh, I'm gonna just start with this video, because it's probably the fastest way, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Man Therapy Campaign, for, your, for everybody here to kind of get up to speed with it. And then, after I show this, I'm gonna go back and tell you how we got here. No, not just the hippies. All of us. Hello. Yeah, we got it. I'm Dr. Rich Mahogany. Welcome to Man Therapy. Man Therapy is the story of a campaign that started in Colorado, but went on to spark discussion across the U.S. and around the globe. We were hired to help reduce the suicide rate for working-aged men in Colorado. First, we had to address the cause of suicide, mental health issues, anxiety, anger, depression, substance abuse. Our mission was clear, preempt suicide by helping men before they are in crisis. So we used humor. Yoga isn't just for yuppies anymore. <laughs> and a manly man's approach to get men paying attention. Man Therapy is hosted by Dr. Rich Mahogany, a fictional health professional who's part doctor, part football coach, and part drinking buddy. Men have a way of doing things. A man has his way of eating, of exercising, and of straightening up. And at mantherapy.com, we set out to make the world's first comprehensive mental health website for men, where our fake doctor encourages patients to take his patented five-minute survey, the 18-point head inspection. Man Therapy takes the stigma head on, educates about mental health, provides assessments, and gives men the tools and resources to fix themselves. 
Before we knew it, Mantherapy.com started receiving visits from around the world. We took advantage of the momentum and sent out Man Therapy kits to media and therapy pros. They praised our novel approach and helped us spread the word even further. Health departments from other states started inquiring about adopting the campaign. And then we got another call from Down Under. I'm Dr. Brian Ironwood. Beyond Blue, a health promotion charity, wanted to bring man therapy to the millions of Aussie men battling the same mental health stigma we see here in the U.S. And so was born Dr. Mahogany's brother from a uterus down under. Man therapy has received more than 200 million impressions globally. And here in the U.S., more than 60,000 men have participated in the 18-point head inspection. You don't get this without putting in the work. Dr. Mahogany and the Man Therapy Campaign have proven that when it comes to tackling the tough issue of men's mental health, using humor gets serious results. So shortly after my brother died, um, Colorado Department of Public Health looked at our data in the state of Colorado and realized not only were we consistently ranking as 6th, 7th, or 8th in the nation for highest suicide rates, but that the majority of those deaths were men. And this was also true nationally. 80% of people who die by suicide are male. Um, and the New York Times just came out with an article the last week, I believe, that showed Mortality rates for all kinds of demographics are decreasing in the middle years, except for white men. They continue to rise, and most of that is driven by suicide and substance abuse issues. So just to put this in perspective, in Colorado, we have about 1,000 deaths by suicide each year, and that's been going up consistently. Half of the, uh, we have about 500 or less deaths by motor vehicle accident. And if you consider the fact that we have a no helmet law for motorcycles, we have windy mountain icy roads everywhere, um, we have a lot of reasons why motor vehicle deaths should be higher. So out of the thousand, again, 80% um, of those are male. Only about 60, and of course every single one of them is very tragic, but only 60 are youth. And when you think about suicide prevention, you usually think that it's a youth issue because that's where most of our funding is and that's where most of our attention goes. We never want a child to die by anything. But when your mortality data is showing you that it's actually a different demographic, that's where the, the aha light on went on in our public health department and they started to funnel resources our way. Um, just to put that perspective also, um, yesterday our director um, from the Office of Suicide Prevention shared with me um, that he looked up the prostate cancer death and the testic testicular cancer deaths, and um, in that same uh, time frame of a year, we'll have about 38 prostate cancer deaths and one or two testicular deaths. Um, and yet the funding ratios are very different for those health issues than they are for suicide. Um, okay, we're gonna give this up for now so I can go back to my slides and then we'll come back to it if we can. Okay, so um, this, this uh, kind of a convergence of interest in this issue between our organization, the Carson J. Spencer Foundation, Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment, and then the third key ingredient 
was a private, full-service advertising agency called Cactus Marketing. So one of the takeaway lessons, which I know is part of the focus of this, of this conversation today, is that when we're dealing with health issues that are marginalized and daunting and in the closet and so forth, we really, really need to be partnering with people who understand messaging and who understand how to reach people and cut through all of the clutter that is people are bombarded with today. And so by partnering with this professional advertising agency, um, we have learned a ton about how to reach men. Okay, I mentioned that. So um, for the first two years, um, we did nothing but listen. That's, I think, another lesson for us to learn is that sometimes we'll have a best practice over here that looks really shiny and sparkly, and we feel a sense of urgency to do something, and so we jam it into a different population, and it just doesn't fit. Or we feel good because we did something, but it bounces right off that population. And, and so we really wanted to take our time to figure out what men would really resonate with. Um, and so we did a, two years of focus groups and interviews and in-depth surveys and looking at practices like the Fatherhood Initiative and other things around the globe that were having traction and having success with men. Um, and um, it's beyond the scope of a 15-minute presentation to go into all of that data analysis, but it was really eye-opening as to why our, our typical messages around mental health were totally missing the mark with the highest risk population of men. Next. Um, so this is what we learned. These are the takeaway messages, and they're in the white paper that are in your folders. Number one was that most men, I'm gonna call them double jeopardy men, men with a number of risk factors who are also least likely to seek help. Um, most of that subpopulation of men do not see their despair or distress through a mental health framework. So the whole messaging strategy is if you're depressed, go seek help, bounces right off them. They do not see themselves as depressed. They do not see themselves as having a mental health condition. In fact, they really try to distance themselves from that. So we need to come up with a different way of talking about it. Most of those double jeopardy men see their level of despair through a lens of it's something outside of me. I have a stressful life. I have a difficult relationship. I have unruly children. I have financial issues. It's outside of me, and I am overwhelmed. So really softening the language around mental health, at least on the front end. Now, the second part was absolutely critical, and again, this is where the fatherhood piece really came to play for us. We said, how do we cut through the clutter and reach you? And they said, make it funny. And I, we went, oh my gosh, like, that's suicide prevention? You know, that's not hard enough, and now we gotta make it funny without you know, alienating a whole bunch of people? Okay, we got it. And so the, the Cactus Marketing Group um, took a stab at it and really did a, a nice job of, of finding a, a really nice um, tone with the humor that resonates well. Um, then we said, well, who's the messenger? Who's out there kind of reaching you? You know, is it a celebrity? Is it a sports person? And they said, well, you know, we'll listen to them, but, mm, you know, we don't really think that we can access the same kind of resources they can. So I mean, they might get our attention, but it doesn't really provide us with a lot of hope. Rather, we want role models with what they call vicarious credibility. Somebody just one step above me on the power hierarchy who's gone through something similar to me and can tell the narrative, this is a really important part, this lived experience narrative, that I was overwhelmed, I was experiencing these difficult mental health things, I reached out to something, could be a peer group, could be professional, could be crisis, and now I'm a better, and then fill in the blank. I'm a better leader, I'm a better partner, I'm a better father, I'm a better firefighter, I'm a better construction worker, whatever it was. That's the narrative that they needed to hear from someone right above them on the power hierarchy. Um, then we need to help them connect the dots. Um, as we know, um, the men, especially in that double jeopardy category, tend not to show up for any kind of health care, um, in particular <coughs> mental health health care, but they'll wait till things are catastrophic. But they do tend to show up in primary care or in emergency rooms um, for symptoms that start to feel overwhelming, and the number one issue is sleep. When they stop sleeping, they'll start to show up in primary care and in ER, and what usually happens is they get you know, the five-minute consultation and a medication and they're on their way. So one of the things that they said to us is help us connect the dots because I didn't even know that was related to something like depression or anxiety. Help me connect the dots when I'm, I'm not being able to eat or my energy is shifting that maybe there's a mental health concern that's underlying it. And then the same kind of conversation that we've been having here, 
meet men where they're at. I love the barbershop thing. Um, you'll see that these posters and coasters and everything were designed to go into the sports bars, into the golf clubs, into different areas. Um, the Pepsi Center, which is our big venue for sports, um, they're behind the urinals of all the toilets. And so we wanted to go make sure that we were meeting them where they're at and not expecting them to come to where we are. Next. Okay, the second bullet here is also critical. So the help-seeking literature for men would show us that um, there's disparities in the gender. Women tend to use um, preventative care much more. It's not a big deal for us, especially in mental health, to reach out um, and get help, and we don't expect to have that paid back in any way. But for men, there's a, a reciprocity issue that um, men ask for help all the time. You know, help me clean up my um, attic, and I'll help you fix your car, and then I'll help you move. And, but there's this idea that we pay each other back, back and forth. So the traditional mental health services do not work well for men in this framework. There's, you're not gonna clean the gutters out of your, your therapist's house, it's just not ethical. So we needed to find some other ways that men could have reciprocity if they reached out for mental health, how they could pay that back. Um, this is one of, the way, one of the reasons why I think these peer models for mental health are so critical for men. Um, the first responder community has been using peer models as an adjunct to their professional psychological services for decades. Uh, especially in the larger municipal departments, to great effect. Um, and it's, it's a way may, men can make meaning out of having um, psychological despair or distress um, by paying that back to the man behind them and kind of pulling them along. So we need to think really critically about how we're setting up mental health services and if they're really meeting men's needs. Because I would argue that most of them are not. The idea that, okay, let me get this straight, I gotta take an hour at least off from work, drive across town, go sit in an office which, with who most likely will be a woman and talk about my feelings. Like, I'm not seeing how that is relevant. So we really need to think about how, how our mental health service delivery is matching kind of the ideas that men have about what's gonna be helpful and useful. Um, we need to coach the people who are around the high-risk men, so I love the conversation of the partners and the friends and the people who are having conversations with them. How can those people identify when men are starting to go into distress at this level? How, do they, how can they have compassionate and influential conversations, so moving into the conversation rather than moving away from fear? but moving into the conversation so that they can effectively help this person move into some kind of help-seeking range that's gonna be useful. And then finally, um, there's, a, there's a quote in the qualitative literature that I usually throw up there that's just uh, really eye-opening for me. One of the men in our, in our focus group said, you know, give me the skills to stitch up my own wounds like Rambo. I'm like, you don't, you're just not gonna hear a woman say that very often. Um, but that's, that was a big part of it, like um, a lot of these, Double Jeopardy men have been conditioned from birth, never, never, never show weakness, brokenness, illness, anything, and for God's sake, don't let other people know and don't reach out for help. So there's just, you know, all of this generational conditioning for this to happen. So, you know, they're like, at least give me some self-care tools and tips, at least give me an opportunity to help myself, but give me a benchmark. I'll look at a benchmark. If I'm in over my head, I might consider something else if I know I have a chance to get back. Um, so give me a menu, give me a benchmark, and, uh, but at least give me some tools on the first end to fix myself. Okay, so what did we end up with the solution? We wanted to get upstream. Um, we, are, we originated out of being a suicide prevention organization, but by the time you're downstream, you're just you know, pulling people out of the river. It is exhausting and we lose a lot of them. So we wanted to get upstream and we wanted to um, really uh, address the mental health issues, keep going, um, that were driving a lot of this level of despair. We know that 90% of people who die by suicide have some kind of diagnosable mental health condition, most often uh, a mood disorder, like depression or bipolar illness, and most often comorbid with a substance abuse issue, most often alcohol. So we, we knew that we had to get upstream and start to connect the dots and, and increase men's mental health literacy. Next slide. So our goal are, is really threefold and these each build upon each other. We wanted to create social change among men. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't fly in until one o'clock this morning is because we had two events last night. Um, an afternoon event called uh, Healthy Men Have Healthy Minds. It was a mental health forum for men that was very much dialogue-based, men to men. 
And then um, in the evening we had a celebratory kind of solidarity party called Guys Night Out for Gentle Mental Health and 200 men gathered um, to start to really celebrate the fact that they can be there for each other. This is pretty paradigm shifting stuff for most of the men. We want to have that level of social change and that level of advocacy from men to men to really shift that conversation, elevate the conversation as you said. Um, and then from that, we want men to be able to start to take action and um, understand that mental health is part of their overall health picture and that there's lots of things that they can do to take care of their mental health. That mental health just isn't the absence of mental illness symptoms. It is actually a thing into itself, just like physical health. We have very clear markers of what we need to do to be physically healthy. We are not clear at all on what it means to be mentally healthy. And then ultimately, we want the downstream thing to happen. We want people's to have uh, men to have fewer um, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, and ultimately fewer suicide deaths. So um, I really hope we have a chance to show the video because it's hard to get your head wrapped around this campaign until you actually hear and see and feel the experience. But what the Cactus Group did <coughs> is they created this fake therapist, Dr. Rich Mahogany, who's manning up mental health through the use of humor, and we created a number of outward-facing media assets billboards, posters, coasters, um, bus banners, PSAs, radio, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole idea behind this um, humorous tone is to capture men's attention long enough to drive them to this website portal. When they get to the website portal, it is a virtual therapy experience. So you walk in and it's a room and you can click on all kinds of things and you can move around the room and, and you're greeted by the good old Dr. Rich Mahogany. The number one thing that we want men to have happen in that experience is they get intrigued enough by these, this kind of really well-produced experience that they self-assess. We have an 18-point head inspection where men can self-assess for depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and anger, and then they get fed a triage of options, self-care, peer care, professional care, or crisis care. Um, and we can kind of track their experience throughout this whole thing, but that's the number one thing in the first iteration of this website. Mid-December, we're going to um, relaunch a second iteration of the website that's going to be far more dynamic and invite um, people to come back um, so they can have uh, a number of online tools, cognitive behavioral tools and peer tools that they can engage with. And then we can also track their utilization of those real-time therapies. Um, we have been able to track some of their, uh, at least, interest in, in some of the crisis resources that we're offering. So this is one uh, from the uh, creators of fight, uh, Fighter Jets and Pork Chops. This is probably our most popular poster, You Can't Fix Your Mental Health with Duct Tape. Um, I think it was also over here, you mentioned the importance of a healthy workplace. This is a big initiative with the Carson J. Spencer Foundation as well. We've been doing deep dives within high-risk industries for suicide, and they tend to be male-dominated industries. So first responders came first. We've been working with a number of fire and, and law enforcement. Um, the second one to rise to the top has been the construction industry. And they love this message. They made their whole wellness campaign for the year. You can't fix your mental health with duct tape. They had duct tape everywhere. It was really great. OK. Uh, men have feelings too. No, not just the hippies. Uh, the seventh inning stretch, yoga, the way a man would do it, grilling animal meat, aromatherapy, the way a man would do it. And I have to say, you know, presenting this in front of a, a, a room full of highly educated federal people. Is, it's not where I'm usually presenting, so um, it's usually firefighters and construction workers and all, all kinds of different men that uh, give your mind the same attention. Give your penis might not go over so well with this audience, but uh, there's different audiences that really like you. Um, pooping, meditation, the, man, the way a man would do it. Uh, and then keep going. Um, so then we have these, the cards that I sent out to you. Um, coasters, we have one. These are like prescriptions that Dr. M would give. Uh, these are t-shirts that Dr. M would have in his drawer, so uh, University of Pork Sausage and so forth. So the impact to date, this is pulled uh, July, so our numbers are a little higher today, but you'll get the gist. Um, we probably have close to, um, closer to a million visits at this point. Um, the average time analytic is really critical. So um, in website analytics, having a 30 second um, time spent average on your website is kind of a gold standard. You think about your own behavior when you're clicking through websites, you're like, yeah, that's not what I want, that's not what I want. You're off and on, sometimes in less than a second. So to have an average time of six minutes is an eternity for websites. So that means our guys are going in there and they're poking around and they're visiting a bunch of things. Um, the, the quiz is the 18-point head inspection. Again, we're well over 100,000 now have persisted all the way through those 18 questions. That's a lot of questions. 
Um, and when we developed that, we used standardized screening tools, so questions that we know are pretty good at differentiating high or low risk for a number of categories. And then we mahoganized them with Dr. Rich's tome. Um, now we're well over 30,000 people have accessed the crisis line through the website. Um, and, the, and the impressions, when you start to filter in social media and all the visit, vis, visits and views, are well into the uh, millions. But you'll notice 80% of our visitors are one-time visitors. They're coming in, and that's how we designed it. They're coming in, they're self-screening, and then we push them out to different resources. The new iteration of the website will be um, inviting them to come back, reassess, engage with more tools, and actually build accounts where they can monitor their progress. Um, we have a number of other evaluation components um, because we're partnering with the Department of Public Health. Evaluation from the get-go was incredibly important to us and we just received a $1.3 million grant from the CDC to do a randomized control study. Um, so in four years, I'll tell you some new news. <laughs> Um, this, is, that, this is actually a big issue right now in um, mental health and technology. Well, I guess technology and health overall. The technology is changing so fast that the science can't keep up with it. Right. So we really need to look at better science methodology that's going to be a little bit more nimble so we can get our answers core quickly. Um, but we have two, two ways that we're measuring kind of the impact. Um, and we've had a public health department as an external evaluator take a look at this with us. Um, one is that we have an in-depth survey where people can answer qualitative questions about their experience. Um, we also have what we call little pop-up surveys that come at different junctures of the experience that ask them in that moment what they're experiencing. So these are from the, the longer term survey. And from this we know that we're getting the guys that we wanted to get. 80% of the people are coming are men, they're in our age range, we have a number of military and veterans that are participating, uh, and 40% and are there because of that. Now this is huge when you realize that this is an issue that a, a lot of men are not thinking about proactively or, or wanting to address proactively. So that 40% there because of me is a really good number for us. Um, and then 51% just because they're curious, that also works for us because now they know that they've got a resource in their back pocket should something change in their, in their mental health picture. Um, and then 8% for a friend or family member. Now this, knowing that partners and so forth have are the ones that usually get men to go seek mental health. This is a number we want to see grow, um, but we actually weren't targeting them in this first round. We were targeting the men themselves. Um, so overall, they like it. So that's the gist of this slide. They would recommend it. 51% um, would agree they would be more likely to seek help because of it. Um, they found that the 18-point head inspection in, uh, directed them to the right resources, and they were satisfied with those. Um, we have tales of triumph. So with this, the way this website was set up, we had one character, Rich Mahogany. Um, and so he represents a certain demographic. On the back side of his office are videos upon videos upon videos with many, 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 many different men, different ages, races, and ethnicities, different um, journeys into despair, different journeys out. Um, and that's where we can factor in some of the diversity. Next. Um, so then we asked them spontaneously to tell us the one thing that they liked the best. So this wasn't a checklist where they checked off a thing that we already had pre-provided for them. This was a qualitative response that we aggregated based on themes. And the number one thing that popped up consistently was humor. They said, so many of the health and mental health websites strip us of our last ounce of dignity because they are so clinical, they are so dry. And this did something very different for us. And so from the beginning, our defenses went down. And we thought, this is something different, and they thought about us. Um, they really liked the quality of the site, the fact that it was interactive and really well produced. They found that very refreshing. Um, they liked that it was manly. They actually used that term spontaneously again and again. Um, and then uh, a lot of them mentioned that they could really identify with the character. Uh, and, they, and they found that experience relieving and reassuring. And then we asked them, what's, the, what's one thing you didn't like? And again, spontaneously, the number one answer was nothing. I love it, don't change a thing, it's perfect, blah, blah, blah. The number two answer was there was some kind of technology issue. So when we first launched in the summer of 2012, um, it was kind of a rush job, because the New York Times said, we want to cover you, and so we were getting things out the door. And so then we, we had bandwidth issues, and we had typos, and it was just a mess. So that a lot of them were complaining about that. Most, 95% of those issues have been fixed now. Okay, so then the third thing, the third complaint was, we want more. Can you make a gay man one? Can you make a black man one? Can you make a college man one? Can you make a woman one? 
You know, all of people just wanted more, and they wanted more content. Can you cover trauma? Can you cover sleep? Can you cover sex and relationships? 7% found it offensive. We knew this was coming. Whenever you dabble in humor, you run the risk of offending folks. But when we looked at it and traced it back to kind of who the folks were that were finding it offensive, our number one group that found it offensive, female mental health professionals. You're not our audience. It's just not for you. <laughs> um, so I mean, that's fine. It, you know, you don't have to look at it. Um, we're trying to reach, we're trying to reach some guys that are you know dying, and so maybe we should try something bold and different. Um, and then lack of diversity. Yes, when you have one character, you're kind of pigeonholed into one place, um, and so that's something we still grapple with. And I'd be very open to it, the discussion around that. And then one percent too spiritual. I don't really know where that came from. Um, I think one person talked about a faith journey in the, one of the videos. All right, for 3.0, we listened again, and we said, OK, you need some more content. So in the new version that will be coming out in December, we're going to cover a lot more about different forms of stress, um, disordered sleep, difficult transitions. Again and again and again, this was a big one, whether it's divorce, retirement, getting married, that first child, all of these kinds of difficult transitions, men feeling very alone and unprepared for and overwhelmed by. Sex and relationships and uh, grief, men's grief, especially bereavement by suicide. Go ahead. Um, and then we got some funding to do very specific collateral development and content development around two populations, male military and veterans and male first responders. The male military and veterans piece, we did a soft launch on Veterans Day, it'll continue to grow. The male uh, first responders will probably hit in February. Um, when we did our focus groups with all kinds of different veterans groups around the country, um, they loved it. They loved the humor. They loved the approach. They loved the confidentiality of doing this online. They didn't like Dr. Rich Mahogany. They felt he was kind of a weenie. So um, we pulled him out a little bit out of the, the veterans collateral um, and kind of created a similar look and feel without him being so forefront. Next slide. Uh, and this is the power of doing focus groups. We had about 10 conceptual ideas for how to do this, and we loved three of them. We thought they were really cool, none of us being uh, in the military, and the, and the military folks were like, yeah, no, you, you can't make that joke. Uh, that's too old school. You know, they kind of pushed aside a bunch of ones that we thought were very clever, and these are the three that they liked. MREs are the only things that make you feel like crap. Sometimes life gets foobard. Shit can turn to shit when you're in the shit. Okay, that's what I got for you. <laughs>